The top business stories live from the Sky News City studio. The John Lewis Partnership appoints Tesco's former UK Chief Executive Jason Tarry as its new chair to succeed Dame Sharon White. New investment in electric natural gas to speed the transition to net zero. Plus, why diamond mining has lost a bit of its sparkle. Good morning, this is Business Live with me, Ian King. The next person to hold one of the biggest and most high-pressure jobs in British retail, chair of the John Lewis Partnership, has been named this morning. Jason Tarry, who's been at Tesco for 33 years and who most recently was chief executive of Tesco's operations in the UK and Ireland, will succeed Dame Sharon White in September this year. Well, joining me now is Ashley Armstrong. She's business editor at The Sun and former retail editor at The Times. Ashley, good morning to you. What do you make of the appointment? Hi. Yeah, it's um, it's a great move, I would say. I think everybody is kind of reacting to it very strongly this morning because one of the central things that Dame Sharon White has faced um, in terms of criticism is the fact that she has had zero retail experience. And as you noticed, you know, this is one of the UK's biggest retail groups. And it has had a very tough time in terms of kind of navigating its way out of the pandemic. And um, a lot of people have said what we really needed was somebody who was able to get their grip around the retail operation, know exactly the detail of retail and, and work on that. And Jason Terry, as you said, 33 years at the UK's biggest retailer, it certainly fixes one of those big criticisms. Yes, I mean, it's uh, interesting. Most people assume that uh, he's more of a grocer and obviously JLP owns Waitrose. But I thought it was interesting in the press release, they were underlining the fact that he does have general merchandise experience. Yeah, exactly. And actually, one of the things I've been speaking to a number of people this morning, and one of the things that has been highlighted is Tesco when he when he came certainly under Phil Clark and that ill-fated regime. You know, Tesco was trying its hand at lots of different things. You know, it was trying to take on Amazon with a tablet. It was trying to do general merchandise. And one of the big things that Jason did as um, UK head basically was to really streamline the business and work what work out what was working, what was a distraction, what it could really kind of flex its muscle as. And actually, I'd say in the last few years he's really got a grip on you know using that strength using that scale and really kind of pushing the engine and tesco does loads of things it's um it, it yeah people come to the supermarket to buy their their bread and butter but it does all the other bits on the side so he knows exactly kind of what sells and particularly to that mid-market uh one thing i think that he'll really take advantage of is that there's probably a lot more fondness for the john lewis brand that there has been fondness for tesco in the past so it'll be interesting to see how he wins back customers that way as well Absolutely. I mean, Waitrose has been doing reasonably well of late uh, compared with the John Lewis department stores. I mean, can, can the latter actually be turned around, would you say? Well, yeah, I think Waitrose has been doing OK. Um, it hasn't been kind of firing the, the, the lights up because, you know, Waitrose is one of the most expensive grocers. And so, we know, in the cost of living crisis, people have gone for the cheaper that's switching to the discounters. What John Lewis really needs to do is it's I mean, it has shut 16 of the department stores that were losing money. Um, so what it really needs to do is bring back customers and, and show them that they can trust the John Lewis brand again by by doing that customer service that it prided itself on for many years. People want John Lewis to succeed, but what it needs to do is give them a reason to come to the shops, particularly in this online age where you can basically shop anywhere and there's enough online department stores. We know that Next is really kind of, you know, get all guns blazing at the moment in terms of its online sales and creating an online department store. John Lewis needs to do the same and get people back to the shops. I think there is definitely a hope. All is not lost for John Lewis. People still want to go there for occasions. It has a fantastic nursery service. People use it for gift registrars every time they get married. But um, it needs to kind of get that special source and make it slick operations again. Um, it's noticeable that also Peter Ruiz has come back to John Lewis as its managing director. So we have got a retailer running the department store enterprise again. OK, Ashley, got to leave it there. Good to see you this morning. Thank nice you. To see you. Now, as industry continues to transition away from fossil fuels, electric natural gas, or ENG, is one alternative that's been attracting interest. ENG, which is natural gas derived from so-called green hydrogen, is seen as being easier to transport and store using existing infrastructure. Well, Tree Energy Solutions, or TES, is a leading player in the field, and it's just raised €140 million Euros from investors, including HSBC and E.ON. Well, joining me now from Milan is Marco Alvera. He's the co-founder and chief executive of TES. Marco, good to see you this morning. How will you be putting this capital to use? 
So this is not the first round. Uh, in total, we've raised for projects and at the holding uh, more than 300 uh, million euros. We are a developer, so we are out there to prove that ENG is one of the solutions to go beyond fossil fuels. We need new types of fuels. We need to break this uh, chicken and egg infrastructure problem with hydrogen. Will the demand be there? Will the infrastructure be there? Will the supply be there? Instead of asking everyone to convert their infrastructure, their factories, their homes, their cars, to take hydrogen, we transform hydrogen into natural gas so that everyone can use it today. So the capital is used to scaling up our projects, to taking them to FID, final investment decision, which means we then invest to start producing this uh, product. It's a very special product, and we have partnerships in many parts of the world with some of the uh, world-leading energy companies to, to develop this. I've seen uh, some criticisms of uh, synthetic natural gas that basically you, you're depriving the world of scarce uh, green hydrogen molecules. What do you say to that? So I always say, and I've been saying this for several years, PPWS, which stands for put the panels where it's sunny and, and put the windmills where it's windy. There's infinite sun and wind. Uh, a few hours of the sun that hits the deserts is enough to supply all of the world's energy needs. The cheapest solar energy in the world when it's sunny is 10 pounds per megawatt hour. Uh, oil today is about 60 pounds per megawatt hour, and nuclear, as we all know, is about 100 pounds per megawatt hour. So our job is to take the infinitely available solar and wind energy, where it's sunny and windy, and turn it into a fuel that we can use in today's infrastructure. So we can turn the energy transition on its head, accelerate it, scale it, so we're not competing with electrons that are generated in the UK or in Germany or in Italy. We are going to grab the cheapest renewable energy from Texas, from North Africa, from the Middle East, indeed from Iberia, from the North Sea, adding new renewables to generate new green hydrogen. And this product, ENG, is a way of moving that sun and that wind into our factories, into our power plants, into our homes, uh, to do what we use fossil fuels for, but they're all entirely green, made from solar and wind and hydro. Are you, are you seeing this energy source being deployed largely in Europe right now? Because you, you mentioned the US just now. Obviously, they have a glut of uh, natural gas from uh, fracking just now. Is this primarily a European solution? No. So Japan, for example, which is the world's largest LNG market today, has decided that by 2050, they will replace... 90% of their LNG with ENG. 5% will be biomethane, RNG, uh, which is bio, biofuel, uh, bio natural gas, and 5% will be pure hydrogen. So that's why we launched a global coalition a few weeks ago with Total, with NG, with Sempra, and with Mitsubishi and several other Japanese companies, because this will be a global fuel, like LNG is a global fuel and natural gas is a global fuel. So it, it will be, uh, we, we're now selling, uh, building a project for Canada, for example, the local utility in Quebec will be taking the ENG to decarbonize its, its own grid. Uh, there's a market in the US for data centers, for mobility, there's a market for shipping. This is the ideal shipping fuel to replace fuel oil with ENG. So it's not only for Europe, but indeed Europe is leading the way having decided to bet on e-fuels. And when you think of having to phase away and gradually away from fossil fuels, you need, still need fuels. And so you'll have a world which is going to be about 50% e-fuels and 50% biofuels. And this is true in the Middle East. This is true in Europe, in Asia, in the US. And, and if you look at the world of e-fuels, ENG is by far the easiest to make and the cheapest to move around because you're using all the existing infrastructure. OK, Marco, we have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Good to talk to you this morning. Thank you. Good to talk. Well, on the equity markets, Friday's rally on Wall Street was followed by a largely positive session overnight for stocks in the Asia-Pacific region. As you can see, the Nikkei was the uh, standout performer. Looks like there was a bit of bargain hunting taking place there. In Europe this morning, stocks are trading largely to the upside. Only the uh, Ibex in Madrid letting the side down just now. The DAX in Germany uh, ahead by more than half of 1%. Uh, news of better than expected industrial production in February, uh, the factor there. Here in London, the FTSE 100 has been uh, largely 
it break even there. It's up uh, nine points just now. Gains for the mining heavyweights are being balanced out by losses elsewhere. The leading blue chip gainer is Entain. That's after the Sunday Times gave takeover speculation an airing yesterday. Meanwhile, EasyJet is ahead by some 3%. That's after it received a push this morning from one of the brokers. Outside the FTSE 100, TUI is up by uh, just over, uh, just under 4% right now. The tour operator completed the switch of its primary stock listing to Frankfurt this morning. On well, the foreign exchange market, well, it's pretty quiet, to be honest, ahead of the uh, US inflation data on Wednesday. No moves there again among the uh, major currency pairs. As for the oil price, well, on Friday, that hit its highest level since the 23rd of October last year on supply concerns. It's given back some of those gains this morning. Barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $90.36 a barrel. That is off just under nine-tenths of 1%. Meanwhile, the gold price, uh, that hit another record high this morning. You can see uh, the price of gold up by just over half of 1% right now, $2,343.10 uh, for an ounce of uh, the yellow metal. Well, joining me this morning is Russ Mould. He, of course, is Investment Director at AJ Bell. Russ, good to see you this morning. Um, we should talk about Entain, shouldn't we, really? I mean, um, quite a punchy piece, I thought, in the Sunday Times. Is that what's it moved the stock price this morning? I think it's as good a reason as any. I mean, Entain's had a torrid few years. The shares are trading at multi-year lows, back where they were in 2020 after an acquisition spree that hasn't really worked out, increased regulatory pressure in some of its core markets, particularly the UK, which resulted in the chief executive officer leaving last year. And uh, on a scheduled basis, the chairman's due to step down in September. So there's, there's, there's a lot going on there. And after two failed bids back in 2021, I mean, the share price is miles below the levels that were offered then. It's maybe no surprise that with a strategic review under, uh, underway, that people are either speculating the whole thing's up for sale or at least that certain key assets might be. Yeah, so, I mean, there are some great assets in that business, aren't there? Um, what about the miners, Russ, this morning? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. It's something that's kind of sneaking up. If, if you look, there's the LMEX, London Metals Exchange Index, that covers six industrial metals. That's moving to a year high. The, the C Commodities Index, which covers 19 raw materials, is moving to a five-year high. You flagged gold's at an all-time high. Oil, you've just flagged, is doing well. And, and silver's moving towards a five-year high. Uh, so it, it maybe feels as if you know the bond market has been looking at this forecast of cooling inflation and interest rate cuts and thinking maybe inflation's running a bit hotter than we thought, economy's running a bit hotter than we thought. You mentioned Germany and the US there, uh, and therefore interest rates might not come down as fast as thought. Commodities look to be pricing in that higher economic activity. Mining stocks may be starting to cotton on as well. And this morning, you know, Fresneo, the big Mexican silver miner. Uh, Anglo-American and, and Glencore are towards the top of the FTSE 100 leaderboard. Yeah, very interesting developments there, Russ. Now, I know Tesla is one that a lot of your clients uh, trade pretty actively. We've had some interesting news flow there over the last 48 hours or so. Yeah, a bit of push and shove between uh, Reuters, the news agency, and, and, and Elon Musk, the major shareholder and, and creative and driving force behind Tesla. Reuters ran a story saying that the Model 2 which is Tesla's you know, sort of entry point car with a, with a price tag of around 25,000 US dollars, that that's been scrapped. Uh, Mr. Musk came back on his uh, preferred social media platform X and said, well, actually, no, that's not the true. And he, and he used words like lying, which was, was pretty strong stuff. And in response also to the share price dip, he said that on the 8th of August, Tesla would make a major announcement on the theme of autonomous driving and robo taxis. I mean, Mr. Musk has been promising a lot here for several years, saying it's, quote, a couple of years away. So it'll be interesting to see if he can come up with something a little bit more concrete this time. Waymo, which is owned by uh, Alphabet, Google's parent, is seen as being a lot further ahead than Tesla in autonomous driving. So maybe Mr. Musk is going to try and close that gap when he announces something on the 8th of August. Indeed. Um, do, do you think, though, going back to the, the point about the budget vehicle, the Model 2, he's been slightly put off by the fact that the Chinese are just able to knock out these vehicles so much more cheaply? Yeah, I mean, if you look at what BYD and the Chinese are doing, they have been giving Tesla a torrid time on the market share front. We've actually seen the overall Chinese EV market slow down a little bit. We saw Tesla's volumes fall from the fourth quarter of last year to the first quarter of this year, which, again, hasn't happened terribly often. So I think that has that was one of the reasons that, that Reuters cited. Again, Mr. Musk did, however, push back on that. But the share price has been paying attention. It peaked at north of $400 in 2021, and it's less than half that now, whether it's over concerns of competition, slower market, the cyber truck not taking off as quickly as expected, or indeed autonomous vehicles being later than planned. Yeah, fascinating story, this, Russ. In my experience, Reuters don't get it wrong very often, but uh, we shall see. Thanks for joining me today. Pleasure. Pleasure.
Now, these are not easy times for diamond miners. Falling demand in both the United States and China has weighed on prices, which are now down around 25% from the all-time high they hit in early 2022. It's caused Anglo-American to recently write down the value of its 85% stake in De Beers, the world's biggest diamond miner, by £1.3 billion. Pounds. Well, joining me now is William Lamb. He's chief executive of Lucara Diamond. Uh, William, great to see you this morning. Production is still below where it was pre-pandemic. When do you think globally it gets back to those sort of levels? Well, I think we would most probably prefer to see it not get back to those levels. <laughs> I think the, the, the major part of your production is still being governed by um, the, the majors, El Rosa and De Beers. And they really will be able to control. The smaller miners, such as ourselves, Petrogem, um, really want to have something special which they can sell to the market. And I think there's, there's when it comes to diamonds, Lucara sets itself apart in terms of what we produce versus what the global, global market does. But I think um, if we look at new production coming on, there's one new mine opening um, at, the, the, at the moment in Angola, but no syst or systematic exploration is being done where we can see um, demand or supply increasing in the future. So we're really looking at a constrained market from now on. What about the demand side, and in particular China? So China's a, a critical component in, in the demand. We saw China grow from about 7% of global consumption up to in the low to mid-teens. Um, we see a lot more um, goods now still flowing through India into, into the US. The US is still a, a critical market for us. But China's an interesting one to watch. When people do find liquidity um, in, in certain aspects, the one market that recovers quicker than everybody else's is the, the, the diamond market. So it is, we, we, we live in a bit of hope that that's going to come, um, but it is very cyclic in how we see the prices of diamonds and the demand actually roll through. Now, you mentioned Al Rosa just now, obviously the big Russian producer. The G7 banned exports of Russian diamonds at the beginning of this year. What sort of impact is that having on supply and demand dynamics? So that's a really good question because it's important to understand that the mechanism by which the G7 is now trying to standardise whether you actually have a diamond or not, they've set that at a one carat rough stone or around about a half carat polished. When we look at the production profile for Al Rosa, more than 80% of their diamonds fall below that. So we don't really see um, the, the impact that the G7 would want as starting to affect the supply of Al Rosa goods into the market. Those are still most likely going to make their way through India and China. And we do know that fairly recently there's been a, um, a sale of, of Russian goods through those markets at discount prices. Um, and a lot of people go, oh, that, that, that's not good. We're going to see a flood of polished diamonds into the market. But when you really start to look at what causes the, the volatility in the, the polished diamond market, it's generally liquidity events where people have more money so they overpay. This is the reverse of that. So we may see lower goods coming onto the market, which will actually mean liquidity for the middle market, which is good for, for people like us. Now, obviously, uh, you own a digital uh, sales platform called Clara. W what sort of volumes are you seeing there? Where, where's the activity just now? So actually, I think the, the, the G7, so we still have a, a fairly low volumes and we are looking at how best we maximise that. And I think the G7 sanctions, because of the provenance which Clara represents, starts to play in the back of people's minds going, actually, we have a, a proven system where you can drive a greater return for the value of your diamonds and maybe we should start to look at this at the moment. And uh, what sort of uh, share of global trade do you now have on Clara? Um, we're, we're still working on it. It is a, a, a work in progress. I think the, the original concept of Clara is still um, a brilliant one where people can actually buy what they want versus having to go out and sell goods that they get from, especially the majors, the, the, the boxes on the secondary market. So we're looking at still a very, fairly low component of that, but we are now refining what actually we, we class as a, a qualifying diamond on Clara. Whereas I think the original thesis was any diamond could go. What we are finding out and what we have found out over the last few years is the quality needs to be very specific um, before people will actually make a bet on buying a stone. All right, William. Busy time for you. We do appreciate you spending some of it to talk Thanks to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Still to come here on Business Live, it's time for savers to think about their investments as the new tax year begins. Stay with us.
Martin Brunt, and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. <laughs> Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News, at the Old Bailey. You want to talk business? Meet me in the onboard lounge. Fly Emirates. Fly better. Thank you. Welcome back. It's the start of a new tax year and with it the opportunity for savers to tuck away another £20,000 in their ISA. Some 1.6 million Britons did this in 2021, the latest year for which figures are available, the vast majority of whom had incomes of less than £100,000 a year. And that allowance could soon rise by £5,000, with the Chancellor proposing a so-called British ISA. Well, with me now is George Godber. He's Fund Manager at Polar Capital's UK Value Opportunities Fund. George, good to see you this morning. Do you do you have any sort of sense on the timing of this British ISA? So the Treasury's launched a consultation period. That runs to the end of June. They are asking for companies and people, interested parties to get in touch with their feedback. So the policy is moving forward. It's obviously a range of policies. They've, they've addressed something in the pension market as well, talking about increasing asset allocation there. So these are some positive first steps from the Treasury. I mean, the Treasury obviously hopes this is going to incentivise investment into the UK stock market. Will it succeed? So. The first point, why bother? You know, you're talking about 2,000 companies, there's 5 million businesses in the UK. Why focus on this lot? They're mega important to UK taxpayers. They generate well north of 10% of direct tax revenue. If you include indirect taxes such as stamp duty or capital gains or on dividends, it's a considerably bigger number. So very, very important for the health of the UK economy and for all savers and for all taxpayers. Will it work? Yes, I actually think it can make quite a meaningful contribution. But it's shocking, isn't it, the amount of money that, is, that goes into cash ices rather than stocks and shares. I can never get my head around this. Do you know, I actually saw today a really an awful chart in some respects looking uh, that Goldman Sachs produced, looking at the percentage of UK household wealth in equities. And in 1990, we had the same percentage in, as the US. And now they've done that and we're flat. So as a country, we are not putting aside enough into the market to, for you know, people saving their retirement compared to some of our economic rivals. Yeah, this is a chicken and egg situation, though. What, what came first? Was it lacklustre UK stock market performance or the loss of interest from retail investors? That lacklustre sort of loss of interest certainly started around the GFC. This is a multi-decade problem. 
Um, I think if, if you look at performance, so if we look, look say, the FTSE 250 index, it's actually a moneymaker. If we go back to its inception, it's compounded at 10% a year. This is pretty good. It's outperformed world equity. So sometimes I think we're sort of quite downbeat on our own market. I actually think there's some real bright spots if you look just, just below the bonnet. Is there a case for saying that actually the tax breaks afforded in an ISA should apply just to UK companies? I mean, Simon French from Pamyours, regular on this programme, was making that case again in The Times today. Well, actually, do you know what? It's a really interesting If you think about the tax breaks, as, as the government looks at it, it could be between 30 or 50 billion. I mean, it's a very, very, very big number. So why do they want to retain some of that here? If you look at, say, the pension industry, we're now adding towards UK pension assets, 2 to 4%. Compare that to France, Germany, Australia, US, north of 30 that's why this debate is happening. If we want to increase R&D productivity, if we want to lower UK cost of capital, that benefits listed businesses, but all UK businesses. So I think it's really what all political parties are going to look at this and see how they can improve growth through pulling policy levers. Yeah, it's good that the Treasury's finally looking at it, at least. I mean, it, have they left it too late, though? Has the, they, has the horse bolted? Uh, I hope not. I think you touch on a sort of a sad point. We've actually talked a lot about policies here for some time. The importance of the British ISA consultation and the statement in the budget of the Chancellor requiring all pension funds to publish the amount they've got invested in UK equities is the first step forward I've seen. We've had a lot of consultation documents, we've had a lot of talk. This is actual action, and that's why I think it's really important. I think that's the bit that's been missing, that we're actually getting you know, the government intention to actually now support the British stock market, which it hasn't, has probably been, as you allude to, somewhat lacking. Yeah, George, we're out of time, I'm afraid. Good to see you this morning. Come back and see us again. Thank you. That's it from me for the time being. I'll be back, of course, at half past four this afternoon with our afternoon edition of Business Live. Hope you can join me for that. In the meantime, do stay tuned. Bit of a, a rare treat for you. Coming up next, it's Adam Parsons. You normally see him in Brussels, but he's here with us in London today. Do stay tuned to see what Adam has to say. See you later. Cheerio.